reality for older adults. Um, but I also do uh, looking at disabilities uh, since older adults uh, have a higher representation of uh, disabilities at that age group. Um, so I think, I mean, I think as a research community, I think definitely figuring out how to connect. I think it, I've noted, I've noticed two different sides when it comes to research communities or, or research labs or, or whatever you wanna uh, define it as. Um, there are those that like to work together um, and are okay with sharing information and collaborating. Uh, and then there are those who really like to work in their silo, um, you know, don't want to talk to anyone, don't want to, you know, share anything, don't want to hear anything. And I think, I think trying to figure out how to open that up a bit more because accessibility is, like you said, it's nothing we're going to solve today. Um, you know, it's a massively huge, um, massively huge problem that that covers a, when you're looking at XR, it covers a multitude of different modalities, uh, different uh, systems from, you know, web-based to AR to VR to MR, you know, whatever you want to do. So, I mean, there's, there's so much room for us all to, to work in that it almost seems a misstep to try and work independently. Why do you think some people want to work independently? I think I think to a degree. Um, so the things that I've at least noticed, uh, at least um, in and around the labs that I've been in contact with, um, is that some some like to play their cards close to their to their best. They don't trust other people um, when we work in a. Um, competitive uh, publishing <laughs> community. Uh, we don't want to be like, hey, I have this really cool idea. And someone's like, that is a really cool idea. I'm going to beat you to a paper. Um, you know, there is that concern. I've heard that concern, you know, spoken multiple times by many uh, different individuals, um, which is kind of sad because we do have so much that we can learn from each other. But that fear of that, I think that's one of the reasons why people work independently. I think there's also um, some people, and this is nothing against the, the, the individuals at all, but you know, there is that definite difference between introverts and extroverts. Um, and so, you know, my wife, for example, would much rather work on her own on things uh, than having to try and figure out working with someone else just because there's a, uh, uh, interpersonal dynamics, there's, you know, the energy output that she would have to put out to do that. So I think that also can play into it. So, but I think the biggest thing is just that fear of, you know, someone taking your research, um, which I get is a true fear. It's not like it hasn't happened. Um, so, but how do you, how can you build a community where everybody's like supporting everyone and realizing that, like I said, there is enough, there's enough meat on the bone for all of us. We don't need to be taking someone else's work. We don't need to be uh, doing that. You know, and then if you really are interested, let's then collaborate, like build that synergy, work, you know, harder, make it better. So that's true. Yeah. I mean, I, I found at least personally, like a lot of times our lab will work on something that I hear of another lab working on a very similar idea. And I think it's good to connect early on to make sure that you aren't approaching the problem in, or you're not approaching exactly the same question, but you're um, maybe uh, looking at different, you're working on the same general problem and each biting off a different piece. Sure. Because like you said, there's more than enough yeah. out there for all of us to pursue. Exactly. Yeah, and it's that, and being able to find out early enough allows you to reach out early rather than um, you get to a conference and you've been spent you've spent the last nine months working on something and then someone presents a paper that's almost identical to everything that you've been do doing and you're just like oh if I only I'd known I could have we could have just made this little tangential change um, and everything 
rather than, okay, gotta go back to the drawing board or change where kind of a little bit where you're going that far in. Yeah, I guess the one thing that researchers are trying to do more uh, is to communicate through Twitter, but sometimes it's really hard to connect uh, with others because um, in, in a way people use Twitter not only for research communication, but also to inform them, themselves or to discuss uh, controversial topics or things like that, that, well, I personally, I will say from my side, I don't really like talking that much about that in public. So sometimes researchers like myself uh, avoid going into Twitter. Uh, so yeah, there might be a better solution in that regard, maybe. Um, creating or having some sort of platform where researchers can talk to each other. Conferences work kind of in that way that researchers can talk to each other, but that's only like a one-off thing and not all researchers can always be present at all conferences nor have the resources to do so. No. Yeah, um, definitely not. If before we go any further, Ricardo, uh, did you make sure that everyone is on the Slack channel and then also on the Google Doc? And we need to get um, everyone's names. Yeah, I have been adding them. I have been adding them, yeah. Okay, we should do a round of introductions. Yeah, maybe. So Aaron and I already introduced ourselves. Maybe you can go Shiri or yeah sure yeah 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 I'm Shiri um so I co-founded XR Access with Larry Goldberg and um I'm a professor at Cornell Cornell Tech the New York City campus of Cornell University and my research is in accessibility with a focus on XR and the goal of XR Access was really to um to promote research in this area and how to make XR accessible, which is an interesting uh, area with many, many unknowns. And to help push that research into practice, we want to make sure that this time around, when we have this new technology that's becoming mainstream, it's going to be accessible from early on, instead of waiting until, you know, everyone's using XR and at work and for leisure and at school. And all of a sudden we realize, wait, people with disabilities can't use it. So we've seen that happen before with different technologies and we wanna make sure that that doesn't happen again with XR. So that's really the goal of um, XR Access. And, and part of that, a big part of XR Access is then to build this community of researchers um, in order to, to push this research forward, to share ideas, to help form new collaborations and We've got some other uh, ideas that we're hoping to um, execute on also moving forward that involve like actual tangible uh, benefits to researchers, like in the form of, of mini grants or gifts um, to help people uh, promote their work and start new projects. Thank you, Shiri. Um, yeah. You can go ahead there with us. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, my name is uh, Deo Gracias Shidende. Uh, I'm living here in German, south of German. And I'm doing my PhD in accessibility. The dissertation is about uh, accessible uh authoring tools so i i feel i'm in the right ends or in the right community <laughs> yeah i found this community last year when i was really searching about uh, what to include in my research questions something like that 
and uh, I thought it is a, a good community. So this is my first uh, symposium to, to, to participate. Uh, by last year when I joined, uh, I saw that uh, the symposium was already uh, done. So this year I'm really happy to be part of the community and I hope to collaborate with the different people yeah, in this community. We're happy to have you. Thank you, Thank you for coming today. Yeah, I, ha I haven't seen you before. Uh, so we're happy to have you here. Uh, we also have um, monthly seminars for those of you who don't know. And on those monthly seminars, we have researchers present their work. So maybe you could be one of the speakers if you would like to on the upcoming months. Uh, we discuss, we, we give space uh, for researchers to talk about their research. And uh, yeah, it's an opportunity there too. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I saw I saw the monthly seminar in the uh, for this month of June. I think I've subscribed in one of, in this June. Yeah. yeah also, also, I when I get time because also time is really of course <laughs> difficult uh, thing. Uh, so when I get time, I also read the uh, past seminars which have been published. Yeah, they are very uh, useful resources for for my work also. Yeah, third Tuesday of every month, we have a talk. Do we have anyone else? I don't see anyone else uh, on the video, uh, with video on, but Anani, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Uh uh, apologies for not having the video on That's the okay. webcam to work. <laughs> um, it's Ananir. Uh, last name's Ochun. Anan. Um, I use any pronouns I'm comfortable with. Okay. Um, full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a very humble student in this space. I'm very new. Um, I've kind of been part of the XR Access Lab for like a couple months. Um, I came here from an accessibility background, mostly in a uh, disability rights advocacy, public policy in DC. Um, I transitioned into web development shortly after. Um, I'm really interested in XR and its potential use in therapies, especially for those who've experienced psychosis. So some years ago, I um, conducted research in Ireland where I was able to meet with a group of Nigerian immigrants who were talking about their experiences with psychosis. Um, and I was really curious about, you know, not only the fact that they don't really have any access to, you know, mental health services over there, but what it would look like, you know, what helping them adjust to the environment, especially the children who didn't have a stable family structure, what that would look like. So I was really curious what XR can do to help them adjust to their, their very new environment. You said that your background is in accessibility advocacy? Yeah. And now you do accessibility for web, for the web website? That's right. That's right. Yeah, I'm like a somewhat new developer. <laughs> it's like self-taught for like over a year. So I've kind of been, I'm like, I don't know, I still consider myself somewhat new to this space. Um, I think what's been really difficult for me, especially like as a disabled person, getting into XR space, like especially, is like, you know, lacking the, the resources to actually practice these things. <laughs> um, so, you know, of course I'm, you know, I'd like to look at what XR and, you know, these headsets look like for psychosis therapy, right? But I have no idea what that looks like because I don't have the financial means to have a headset. And there are a lot of disabled folks who are kind of in the same position where they want to do these things, but they don't have the material support. Um, but I think that coming, that material support coming from especially non-disabled people in XR access, you know, community would be, you know, that's crucial. You know, if they really say that they're, they're working with and for disabled people, then you need to support them. They need to show up. That's really interesting. So you think that, so is it the resource, the financial resources to buy a headset specifically, or is it also um, kind of knowing where to start and how to start? Honestly, it's both. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and not really having a lot of people to talk to um, mm -hmm. who are in the space who could, who can really offer their time to be a mentor or who are willing to be a mentor um, with also without, I should say, abusing like the, the power dynamics between say uh, a non-disabled mentee or mentor and their disabled mentee. Um, I think that's also kind of important to mention because that can be really um, intimidating, especially when you're so new to this space. Yeah. Um, okay, this is really interesting. So I'm sorry if I start uh, interrogating you <laughs> with questions. <laughs> but um, so, okay, you, so you, I understand that you want to learn more about XR, um, but do you have a, like a specific goal? Um, do you want to use that in your career? Like, do you want to, do you want to be an, an advocate? Do you want to join like the standards organization? Is there something more specific that, like, um, mm. you'd like to work towards? Interesting. I would say in the most general terms, I want to be an XR developer, right? But mm -hmm. I also want to. I'm really interested in creating um, immersive exhibits in museums. I see them all the time, especially in like the museum of like future futuristic something. I think it's in New York, but none of those are actually accessible to blind, low vision, and deaf folks. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like if you're talking about immersing people in the story and as a narrative, then you need to make sure that you know people who are disabled can actually access those that same interpretation and those intentions in your story making mm -hmm. um and like you know i'm also an artist so of course like that was something that really interested me and i would love to do that mm -hmm. yeah so i wonder if you should take a look at some of our work streams at xr access that is that's monthly right um yeah, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how often they meet. I think it might depend on the work stream itself. Oh. Um, but if you want more information, you can go to the website, xraccess.org. Okay. I was just trying yeah. to think mm. that if there are other people out there, other people with disabilities who want to know more about XR or want to dive deeper into this space for certain reasons, um, then maybe there's a need there that we that we can fill that we can fulfill as as the initiative. Absolutely, yeah. I see that Michelle is raising her hand. Hello, Michelle. Uh, you can. I think you weren't here at the beginning, so you can start by introducing yourself. Uh, optionally, mention your pronouns and uh, also. <laughs> Um, mention your affiliation. Thanks. Hey, yeah, my name is Michelle. I just graduated from music recording technology and audio design. I'm a she, her, hers. Um, I am really interested in learning more about XR. Um, I, I don't have an affiliation. Uh, I'm a blind composer and audio engineer, and I'm really interested in developing like XR more for like games and kind of like Unity and all that stuff. Well, we're happy to have you here. Um, Ananir, uh, I wanted to know more why you got interested in specific in, in the applications of XR for the psychosis. Um, yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, so when I was in undergrad, this is around 2017, um, I was really focused on disability and mental illness and wellness and how those concepts differ around the world. Um, I chose Ireland because of a very uh, macabre family history, right? So my Black ancestors were enslaved by Irish people. Um, so I was really curious about what it's like to be a black person, especially there today. Um, it's not a surprise that the parallels are very, you know, they're similar with the US and how we have to navigate the healthcare system and what it looks like when we are seeking help and how we're treated very differently. Um, I didn't really anticipate 
meeting so many folks who had experienced psychosis, especially because they had a similar background in immigrating from Italy. So there were a lot of Nigerian women who were sex workers who came from Italy because Ireland at that time had offered them the citizenship if they had their children there. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a bit of like the citizenship market between uh, the children and the fathers because the, the fathers weren't necessarily known, but whoever had bid the most money, you know, and taking care of the family, they would have like the parental rights and they would be able to immigrate to Ireland. Um, but that family structure wasn't actually stable because the, the fathers decided, oh, well, my wife is too shameful because she's a sex worker, so I'm just going to leave, you know, just really absurd things. Um, so the children ended up suffering a lot. So they were, um, they kind of went to this, this small organization that I found called Corja, and they were talking about their experiences with psychosis and how they view it over in their communities um, and what it looked like when they were trying to navigate their way through the mental health care system and also just in hospitals in general, where if they were experiencing an, an episode, they were placed in the emergency room, but they weren't giving proper care because they were seen as just drug seeking. Um, so, you know, it's it was a pretty... It's a pretty bleak picture, very similar again to, you know, what's been going on in the U.S. So that's, these are like all the things that really informed um, my interest in XR and in therapies and how, you know, disabled people can be more involved and things that would actually, you know, that are made by them for them. <laughs> okay, that's, yeah, that sounds very nuanced and interesting. I, my background is uh, from South America. So I came from South America to study my PhD in North America. And yeah, I can see some parallels here and there. Yeah. Hey, Dylan. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself since you just got in? Hey everybody, uh, I'm Dylan. I'm the, the coordination engagement team lead for XR Access. Um, mostly just hopping to and fro between the, the breakouts to make, th make sure things are all going well. Um, I've had a couple of, of Zoom bombers show up, um, which is not great. Um, if any show up here, just post in uh, help in Slack and we'll, we'll come in and boot them. Um, uh, gotta love people sometimes. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, don't. Don't let me interrupt. No problem so far, but thank you for offering the help. I have also been paying attention to that. Yeah. Um, so maybe uh, I can, uh, we can continue the discussion about the first question that I asked. Uh, what can the research community do as a group to if, improve or streamline the development uh, of accessible XR. Maybe uh, Anani or you may have some thoughts about this since you are a new developer and you're trying to get into this. Uh, it's important to have the perspective of someone fresh because when you have been here doing this work for too long, there are many things that are that you just take for granted if you have been a developer for a while and then you forget these initial steps or needs that people require when they're getting start started. I feel like because I'm a newbie, I really don't have much to offer. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to add as much as I can. Um, I mean, one of the issues that I came across again and right. you know, trying to get into XR was not, having like the educational resources either not literally not knowing where to start <laughs> and because this space is small enough as it is so you know those who are focused on accessibility specifically it was really difficult to contact people and actually like get a response from them of course they're going to be busy with everything that's happening so i don't res you know expect a response but it was really difficult just to get like a 15 minute meeting with somebody or even to get like an email back um even after you know uh, attending AxCon, there were some like uh, immersive developers who were there and it was really difficult to contact them too. And so just like not really having an idea of where to start, <laughs> um, knowing that networking is important and forming connections, but just like not getting anything back for very valid reasons, of course. But yeah, that's, that's something that's been really difficult. One of the things that's been difficult. 
Are you signed up for the XRXS newsletter? I am. Okay, good. Yeah, it's been, um, I've been like uh, glancing at it, uh, like kind of like week by week. And also, um, I already mentioned it before, but also, you know, getting the material resources to kind of, I don't want to say play with the equipment, but actually use the equipment, especially because, you know, if you're someone who intends on working with these things and developing for these things where these are required, um, it would be good to actually have your hands on it and to be actually able to use it for yourself so you know exactly what you're building and what it looks like. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, since there are so few of us also working on this, but people are more, uh, I, sorry, that sometimes I use weird wording, but people that are exploited or not, not exactly exploited, but people that are good at their job here, since they're we are so few, like there are not that many people working on accessibility. They have too much to handle, right? So then it's harder to, to, to establish this communication, like you said. Um, Michelle, maybe I, I messaged with you yesterday a little bit. I know that you were interested in in one of our programs. So one of the things that the XR Access Research Network is doing is hosting a yearly program for current undergrads. Um, uh, last year we had four, this year we have eight. So we're trying to have more and more undergrad students get involved in XR accessible development. Um, and we're also paying them for that. Um, Obviously, this is not enough. It's just making a dent into a bigger problem. But yeah, Michelle, I wanted to know if you can also share some thoughts about like barriers that you have found to to get involved or like, yeah, just we, we would we would just like to know more about what are some issues so that we can think about it here. Um, index or access research network. Michelle. Oh, I think she disconnected. Hmm. Oh, well. I see we have a new person here. Karin Campanario, um, maybe you can introduce yourself if, if you would like. Um, Hi, I'm not in research, but I'm very interested in research. I, um, I work as a UX designer and um, very interested in innovation and making things accessible. So um, would love to implement some research uh, results and and participate if possible. What's your affiliation? Where are you from? Uh, um, I'm working for um, Oxford Medical Simulations, um, medical training in VR and in the browser. So uh, there's a web application and VR application, and it's it's not fully accessible, but uh, <laughs> we're trying. Yeah, for um, in a previous set of breakouts, so I was moderating a breakout on turning research into practice. So we were talking about how to make research more um, available and yes. known to yes. yeah. people out there in industry and practitioners. Yes, that's why I'm here to know <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So one thing you might be interested in, again, I'll, I'll plug the, we have a research network um, and it's, it's really designed to be like a forum for researchers to share uh, their work, current work. Um, we have a seminar on the third Tuesday of every month. Oh, good. Yes. But where are you, because I missed the chat in this, I saw missed the chat. Where are you going to post it in the Slack channel somewhere? The research network? 
Uh, the best way to get information about that is to sign up for the newsletter on the website to indicate that you're interested in the research network, okay. xraccess.org on the main website. Um, yeah, we will also share later on the general chat uh, the Twitter account of XR Access. Uh, we also tweet about uh, like a reminder when we're having the event, who will be the speaker, what the topic of the talk will be about. So, yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Karen, can you repeat what was your affiliation? I couldn't catch the, the full name. Um, I'm currently at Oxford Medical, Oxford. Oxford Medical Simulation. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe I, I contribute some of the difficulties um, personally I'm facing uh, mm -hmm. in my research. I'm also supposed to develop uh, some uh, augmented reality authoring tools, which are accessible, of course, because that's the uh, main idea. The problem is uh, the technology is still not supporting. Uh, most of existing technology, which can help developer to develop something, they are really, maybe for me, they are really uh, not supporting accessible development. Like for example, if you are developing in a web, normal web, uh, we have this WCAG, you can have these guidelines and then uh, you know that the color contrast and what and what. Okay, you can do the same in, in, in virtual reality, augmented reality, but then for example, there are other very important uh, tags. For example, alt tag is missing. Uh, before, before, before this, I attended the how to make it 3D uh, accessible. Yeah, so there are some efforts I, I, I've seen in the Mozilla Hub, but is it still at the baby stages? And it becomes so hard to, to program. It becomes so hard to program. I think we need to, to continue to, 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 to voice until these uh, big companies which are producing these technologies to include accessibility also. You mean the authoring tools should include accessibility or the products itself or, or both ideally probably? Yeah, I think both, both authoring tools and even the products yeah, of course, for example, uh, some new technologies, for example, the Microsoft HoloLens 2, I think now it's, it's, uh, they have been really improved, but it's still not yet. Yeah, there's a big gap in the way that XR technologies and XR applications developed for the hardware do not uh, include in an intuitive way uh, the development of accessible of accessible applications. They just give generalized guidelines and leave everything else to the developer, which makes it much, much harder to then include them into their applications. So in the end, it gets cut off, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I mean, at this point, we don't really know um, how to apply the guidelines to like a 3D right. interaction paradigm. That's what there the are, research is for. There are, I, and, it's, and it's really strange because there are a lot of it a lot of specific examples on how to develop certain kinds of UI, uh, like, oh, how to do lists, how to present this kind of information, how to present these objects, and you have a demo for it, but then something as simple as changing the font size, they don't have any demos for something that basic, which would make things way easier for any developer but yeah they're... what do you mean changing the font size how an application should look when the font is changed i mean giving uh so so there are many like small projects which have like short snippets of code that show how it's an ideal or a good way of developing certain kinds of ui but uh, the 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 things that are essential to make applications accessible, like having good contrast, like how to develop good contrast uh, inside your application, integrate and like allow the user to change colors to make the contrast that they want, or uh, how to make dynamic font change inside your application so that regardless of how the user changes this, it doesn't break your UI. There is no information about that, or it's always extremely outdated. Like mm. it doesn't like they, it's like they check off a list of five years ago, they, and then they can claim that they have a, some sort of guideline, but in reality, it's not applicable the developer has to go go on and from scratch figure it out again with the new changes of the code base. Yeah. So I'm a bit new in um, VR design, but shouldn't tools like Unity and Unreal and all the others, shouldn't they kind of provide solutions for that? Right. Are there a lot of research projects from them uh, or plugins, extensions that they might include or that, that we might not be aware of? Because it's easy to change the font size. I mean, you can have a, exactly. a different way of inputting it and Unity will improve it. And, but then, as you said, it shouldn't break the design. So like our product uses captions, but, and, and, I did design to change font size, but I wonder why, is, why isn't that a standard way? Because a lot of people use Unity or Unreal, but those are big ones. So what, don't they have these kind of um, what happens if um, solutions? Not that I know of. I mean, this is really... Everybody has to create it for themselves. It's silly. At, at this time, yes. I mean, the problem is also, it's kind of unclear of what exactly you have to create, right? Like, are we talking about font size for captions? Right. Um, in, in my case, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. right, so, right. so that's something very specific. Um, but then there's this question of like, how should the captions be displayed? Uh, where should they be displayed? Um, and actually captioning, there, there's a, a group that's working on captioning in VR immersive specifically. Captioning. Yeah, immersive, the immersive captioning group. Um, and then, but so, so we just don't know yet. Like we just don't have good standards yet. We have um, learned so much from web design and, and people can change so much in their settings and they're so free to get exactly right for them personally. We should be able to do that in VR. That's what boggles my mind. But I think that the web standard is like an exception because you can actually streamline one thing because everyone has to be like with within an accord but vr the the 
the well the way that I see the problem of VR and AR is that there are many competing platforms uh, that they have their own way of developing the applications that they run and mm. also they they have different parading paradigms of programming it's not that's my observation i'm not entirely 100 percent sure if it's if 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 this is the key issue but since they don't have to get together and say okay this will mean a this will mean b and in this way everyone can extract information from you know the environment the vr environment or your ar environment there's no way to consistently access that essential information that is in the environment so then it gets all diluted in different accessibility guidelines maybe uh apple does a great job at uh uh, showing information for AR phone applications, but then you have the Oculus. Uh, they don't have too much information, but then in Oculus you can also run Unity applications and Unreal. So it's like a it's very convoluted. That's an interesting point, Ricardo. I hadn't really thought about that too much, um, but I, I think it's a good point that deserves consideration. In, in my mind, I just think that maybe, maybe captioning is a, a bit more straightforward in terms of trans, taking the guidelines that apply to the web and transferring that over to a 3D space. But if we think about um, non-visual accessibility, accessibility for people with visual impairments, I mean, there it's just so completely different. There's a completely right. new you, paradigm. But there are so many uh, artificial intelligence software tools that you can plug in for yes describing hmm. yeah i mean there so yes it's true there are tools that um so for example there are like computer vision apis that'll tell you what's in an image right yeah so it can tell me like well the big players have it right microsoft yeah Google. yeah right so i'm looking at you right now Amazon. Like, i'm looking at you yeah. right now through zoom and it'll tell me you know um woman uh headphones um browning whatever. yeah <laughs> suspicious look um but then that doesn't necessarily tell me what i need to know for the context um True. and and if i if there's a whole 3d environment then maybe i need to i want to interact with people in the environment there are people all around i want to get from point a to point b in the environment i want to be able to um see people gesturing, I want to be able to, um, to have uh, conversations with people. I mean, it, it's just endless. But shouldn't you be able to then, I still think there, I hope in which there are standard ways to tell which kind of information you are after. Like if, if you're looking for specific things, then you can ignore facial expressions, but if you, have a communication purpose, then those are the most essential. Um, so it would be it would be great to get those tools to filter for purpose. Yeah. Isn't, is that not already possible? No, not out of the box. Okay. Not at all. No, that not not even close. I mean, that's the research that we're all doing. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, thinking I'm so about looking forward things. to the future. It's <laughs> so too early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thinking about different use cases and how we can make the information. What are the information needs for different use cases and how we can make that accessible? Yeah, cool. Gosh, I have good eyes, but I would use it <laughs> just to filter. I, I, I do everything I, with captions normally because yeah. it's amazing how much you miss without. Yeah, like descriptive English for our films is amazing. Everyone, I, so so one amazing fact that I recently learned, I think. Yeah, it was on one of our uh, seminars actually. Uh, Raja Kushalnagar, one of the speakers yesterday, um, he mentioned that in Netflix, actually, all 
users that uh, have English as a second language, about like half of the users or more than that, all of them use captioning. And captioning was a technology first developed for people that were deaf. Yeah, I always put it off. And now everyone uses it. And I have seen parallels of that in things like video games where you think that uh, people wouldn't want to have uh, more information or there might be some information overload. But, but yeah. if it's elective, if you can choose to have exactly. it or not have it, that is the best, right? If, yeah. if you don't want it switched off or if you want it in a different way, that would be amazing. Yeah, one thing I really like on Netflix is that some shows have... Um, I mean, this is not just on Netflix, but uh, I've been using it on Netflix. They have audio descriptions for people with visual impairments. And it's actually really fun to be able to watch like one of your favorite shows um, without having to look at the screen, like while you're doing something else, like while you're cooking or cleaning or running or whatever. Um, so you can just turn on the audio descriptions and listen. Yeah, I, I sometimes do that. Oh yeah, I think more yeah, people should so do it. Yeah, so I I normally read, but yeah, I have I have put that on. Yeah, I think people it's just don't know about it. But interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't know that it had the uh, descriptions. Some shows, not all of them. But they are still manually created. Yeah, so that yes. is something that would be great in virtual reality. Like, yeah, she's turning around. She's doing this. This happens. That happens. Um, all these kind of cues yes yes yeah and it'd be interesting to do it in a to see if there's some kind of different different approach you should take for audio descriptions in an immersive like 3d space yeah because at, if you turn around you don't want to pause and play the audio descriptions it's just that would be at the moment um to do it manually it would be Hard, I guess. Or it could be start. I don't know. It probably exists already. I don't know how you pronounce your name. Dio Gracias? Is that your name? Dio Gracias. Dio Gracias. Oh, that sounds very Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think the solution for authoring would be that the authoring tools become more inclusive of the, or that there are totally like enhanced those, or do you think it is actually useful to have custom made platforms for certain types of experiences? Like I, I know there was this, there is this project is free on GitHub. I think that if you, if you, uh, say a word then like then the 3d model comes and flies in so you can have um you can say three goats and then in the virtual space you see three goats but it, if you take that concept you could by speaking create an experience you know because that that application it it does speech to text and then create something so you could you could have an authoring tool that creates what you say or something you know it, but that would be super bespoke and totally different than current um authoring tools i'm just wondering if, if people need quite simple um applications and they want to make it themselves if, if there could be bespoke ways to enable them to make and customize them Yeah, I think, he, um, yeah, for example, uh, what you have just said, there are several applications which can convert maybe speech to text or text to speech, something like that. But uh, the main problem in the XR is, uh, uh, is imagined. Is 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 beyond the, uh, to 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 see and and to hear, but it is imagine to have that feeling that 
you are mm. you are maybe for example in vr you are in 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 that room maybe you are in that top of the mountain uh, how do we how do we uh, feel that because it's 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 it's, it's really a feeling mm. yeah how 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 do we make it somebody who cannot see to feel um, that mm. I, I have designed one experience for a um, sensory booth once, uh, but that is, there are more now, but it's still very niche. It's, um, it's um, an environment, a small environment where you go into, uh, and once I, I have used, you sit down and you have wind and um, oh, um the temperature changes and you have smells, they had 180 smells and you have the visuals that could have hopefully an audio description. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, and then then it's completely immersive with that. And, you know, you could have, um, I, I had one experience that I, I just experienced that had a moving platform underneath me to, to simulate um, movement a bit. Um, but you will still miss out on some things, right? It's, it's uh, it won't be the full experience, but it could help. But it's so, yeah, that's so costly. It's not very. Mm. Yeah, in the in the, I think it's not only uh, applications, but also hardware. The technological development in hardware should also think about this. For example, uh, we have sensory growths nowadays and we have all those optics technology. If they are combined, they can help somebody, maybe one sense organ is not proper, but other sense organ can be used to, to, to create the immersion. Mm. Mm. Haptic is good, yeah. Yeah. Well, I should come back in 20 years. We'll have so much for everyone, right? Mm. It's all restarting. Mm. I am going to follow the newsletter and Twitter and look at the research platform and see what there is already. I guess we can throw in one last question. Maybe Aaron, since you talked about this a bit at the beginning, if you could um, talk about this I, like I would like to hear your thoughts. Maybe what can the XR Access Research Network do to uh, promote the collaboration between researchers more? Sure. I mean, it's to a degree, it's a tough question because I think we're doing a decent job currently. I think the trying to figure out how to maybe do some more outreach. Um, and maybe, and also probably try to do some, I will never turn down listening to a talk about someone doing some research in XR. Uh, it's always great to hear uh, what someone's doing, but I think it's also good to have these times and maybe, you know, either quarterly, um, quarterly sounds nice. <laughs> quarterly have a more of a informal meeting where we can just kind of sit down and everybody can be like, hey, what are you working on? What are you working on? Rather than just focused on one person, which don't get me wrong, I love those talks. They're fabulous. Um, but I think being able to get a bigger picture of what the community is working on um, is really good. Um, and then just trying to, to remember, you know, whenever you're talking to someone that you've just met, that 
you're not sure if they're an XR Access member or not, um, that doing, that's doing research to be like, hey, have you heard of? <laughs> and being able to bring more and more of those uh, research individuals uh, into the group, I think, you know, yeah. So just brings that. I, I have a question, follow up on what you said. What do you think are some good ways to reach out to people like you, Aaron, and people like you, um, Dio Gracias? I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. How did you hear about this particular event? And what do you think are good ways to reach out to other researchers? Because I don't think we're doing that as effectively as I would like. I mean, at least reaching out to you know new research students and stuff like that. I think that's always going to be tricky, and I think you know trying to keep an eye on Twitter and see if you know people are popping up and starting to talk about what they're doing in research. Uh, recent reaching out to those uh, faculty members who are in you know in this world and working in this area, and at least doing it like, hey, let your grad students know, you know, or. You know, and, and trying, I guess, even to realize that there are a lot of different, it's not just computer science, it's not just informatics, it's not just information science that are that are working on this problem. It's how do we reach out to those, you know, more the 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 further away from the core of what you would expect. How do we how do we get uh, those individuals in there? And I think it's just going to be trying to, you know, I don't know if there's any like really good way of doing it, which is sad. I really wish there was just like, here's the listserv, boom, send out an email, boom, done. Um, yeah, we have to get those people that, on the listserv know. though. That's the trick, right? Right, exactly. And so I think just trying to keep building that network. And I think as we continue to build the network, and I think, and this is uh, something I really wish I could have, uh, connected with Ricardo about uh, earlier, because at CHI, there was a last minute uh, in-person uh, people who worked on accessibility. Um, and so being able to start throwing maybe more of those together at some of the bigger in-person conferences, which I know mm. in-person conferences are still in an up in the air type world, but being able to throw like, a, hey, anybody who's interested in accessibility we're gonna meet out here in the lobby during this break for you know half hour, 45 minutes and just network. That's so a great that idea. Way. That's a great so. idea. We should do that. We should do like, I. we can even throw some money at it and do like an XR access happy hour. Yeah, I think that would be great. I think that just, cause then it can be not just for people who do it, but are you interested in it? Come and check and yes. find out what, what it's like. So. Yes. Yeah, you have said what I wanted to say, but just to come to, to say a few words, I think uh, those who are member, we need to be good ambassadors to others. Totally. Yeah, because uh, for example, we have our uh, research group. There are some PhD students and the supervisors. And the, because I am subscribed in the, the mailing list, so I saw these announcements earlier, maybe two or three months ago. Uh, I got it, I forwarded it to, to a research group. And anyway, none of them has attended, but at, at least they are aware that something like this is happening. And the, according to the culture of our research group, because they know that I have attended, in the next meeting you have to give the summary of, 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 of this uh, symposium. I hope by that way, message little by little is going forward. If we, if we are good ambassadors, we can help. But for me, I really appreciate, I see, uh, XR Access is doing a really a great job. I, I really appreciate it. So here's a quick question. If we were to do something at a conference, like let's say we were to give out swag, you know, like a little gift, what 
what would you like it to be? What do you think would be useful? Something that you wouldn't necessarily throw in the trash the second you got back to your hotel room. Right. Yeah, because so often you get, you know, conference swag is just kind of like, yeah, eh, whatever. Yeah. Um, because even like I was about to just say like a thumb drive, they're always great. But then even those I have so many because yeah. I have them from a ton of conferences. Um ooh. I think, you know, honestly, what would be cool if we could do, uh, hold on, let me see. Um, so maybe swag isn't the right thing. Maybe something else. Well, one of, so here's my, here's my badge from Kai. Uh -huh. um, and so this is uh, uh, actually a pin that's from uh, Able Gamers, uh, the charity. Oh. Um, and so every conference I go to, I wear this pin. And I would say that maybe, and on it, it just says, so everyone can game. And it's got like a little monster uh, with a controller on there. Um, the the charity or the yeah the charity does a lot of uh, work to provide um, uh, gaming uh, equipment that uh, people with disabilities can use to get back to gaming. Um, but every conference I go to, I would say that probably three to ten people ask me about the pin on there because it's something different. And mm -hmm. so I think if we could have something like that, that we could give out that they would want to show, and then it can be constantly uh, driving attention to it. So it's mm -hmm. not just a one shot deal. Yeah. So not exactly sure how we would do that, how we make a pin. Well, I know how you'd make a pin, but you know, I think that could be something like that. I think could be really interesting. Okay. To do okay. It. Yep. We can talk more after this at some point. Yeah, let's yeah. talk more. Yeah. This is closing now, but thank you all so much for the ideas and the comments. Anani, De Brazos, Karen, Cherry, Aaron. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, hosting this, Ricardo. Thanks, Ricardo. Of course. Thank you. Yeah, so thank I'll you. See you all later. <laughs>